Hello. Hopefully you can hear me. My giant mic. So I don't, YouTube's not working out, but that's fine. I think Restream is trying to get it going. We've got five folks on Twitch and I'm recording. That should all be good. Maybe YouTube's having trouble or something. Maybe I made the title too long or something like that. Oh yeah, can you hear my mouse? Sorry about that. There's nothing I can do. All right. Um, hopefully I don't have anything top secret up on the screen. Um, I'm not going to worry about YouTube. If it starts up, let me know. I just wanted to watch the chat if it does get going. Do you like my Pie Cascades 2020 shirt? I love the pink. I thought it was fitting for this. Okay, so um, thank you for the link, Mr. Certainly. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Scott. I work on Adaf or I work for Adafruit on CircuitPython. Um, CircuitPython is an easy to use uh, version of Python meant for microcontrollers. Uh, we are not going to be doing Circuit Python today, though. Um, it's Saturday. That is my weekday job. <laughs> so uh, today I will not be doing any uh, Circuit Python. I've done some deep dives on Circuit Python before, so if that's what you're looking for, uh, go ahead and check the the Adafruit YouTube. There's some recordings there of uh, of me hacking on Circuit Python. But um, it's the weekend. I'm home alone. My wife is on a trip. Uh, so I was like, hey, you know what? I think I, what I'll do is I'll actually stream and I'll work on a project that I kind of do for fun. Um, and that I think is also very impactful, potentially impactful and potentially very, uh, very helpful for a lot of people. So uh, what that project is, is something I'm calling, if you see me looking this way, it's because that's where I can see that everything's okay. Chat is here and Twitter's over here too, you know? Always following Twitter. Um, yeah, so uh, this is not going to be like a typical Adafruit stream. Uh, if you've seen my deep dives before, you'll know that they're they're very random, very kind of like fly by the seat of your pants. And they do tend to last two or three hours. So um, strap in. I've got one glass of water here, and I've got actually another one on the desk behind me. Uh, as we go through this. Um, as you can see uh, on my screen, I've got Sigrock pulled up uh, their website here. And Sigrock is a logic analyzer piece of software. It's open source. And uh, one of the challenges with them, yeah, as Mr. Certainly says, sit back, grab a coffee and tea and enjoy. Go ahead and do other stuff while you're doing this. But uh, hopefully uh, what I found with my deep dives is that they're very deep. Uh, some people are like, I want bite-sized content, but for those folks who want to dig in and, and really do it, a uh, deep dive, uh, which is basically me working on something for a couple hours while recording it, is a great way to get people going and, and how people can understand what my process is when I'm working on something. Um, so the goal today, uh, SIGROCK is an awesome open source piece of software for uh, doing logic analysis. Now, um, Let's start with the basics. What is logic? What is logic analysis? What what is a logic analyzer? Well, a logic analyzer is a piece of hardware that sniffs uh, digital or analog data lines and records the signals on those lines over time. And then, uh, and, and and the important bit is the overtime piece. So, uh, if you've gotten into electronics a little bit, you know that like a multimeter is one of the first tools that people recommend you get. And a multimeter is great. It can do a lot of things like measure current. It can measure voltage, um, but it really only does it like instantaneously. So just what is it right now? Um, there are other tools called oscilloscopes where you can see over time what happens, but they're very kind of limited. Although some of them have logic analyzer stuff too. Uh, but the basic ones, they'll show you more like 
what a standard waveform is or what a pattern is. What a logic analyzer does is it, it it's kind of more focused on the digital side of things. So, uh, and, and I'm a software person as well. So the questions that uh, a logic analyzer are meant are really what commands or what digital data am I sending across these wires from a microcontroller to a sensor and that sort of thing. Um, it can also answer questions like, uh, I have a NeoPixel, but I don't know if the timing is right. Like, I don't know whether the pulses that I'm sending to the NeoPixel are within the spec so that it could actually tell what the colors are. Um, and a logic, analyzer, a logic analyzer is really nice for that. Basically, what it's doing is it's capturing high and low level logic levels on one or more uh, data lines at the same time against the same reference clock. Um, and then SIGROC is an awesome uh, version of or open source analyzer tool on the on the desktop side. Uh, but it needs to work with hardware. Now we can see here they have supported hardware and they do have a lot of different logic analyzers. Um, but what I've found is that a lot of them are, the inexpensive ones are only available through China. Um, and I prefer not to order directly from China, although the stuff is okay. Um, but, uh, and then there's like some like professional logic analyzers that are very expensive that are supported. Uh, but those are also not quite what I want to... I've never had great success with that um, because the hardware itself is closed, so it's hard to write drivers to, for closed hardware. Uh, the other thing that I haven't really found in terms of the hardware side is I'd really like a logic analyzer that's slow but can handle a lot of lines at once. So uh, if I just switch to my desk here... I'll show you what I've got for a logic analyzer now. Um, let's not do that one. Let's do this one. So um, let me just show you what I have here. I've got the Salier. Salier is an awesome company. They do logic analyzers. This is their Logic Pro 16. Um, and as you can see, it's got 32 pins here, but half of those are ground. Uh, and so it can do 16 pins all at once, and it's USB 3, which makes it really, really uh, quick as well, which is awesome, um, but they are very expensive, and they're only 16 lines. Um, the things that I've been looking into are actually like a keyboard matrix, where it's a lot of, a lot of separate wires, but the signals themselves are very, very slow. So... Um, one of my motivations for doing this is uh, giving myself a version of, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, reading the chat. Um, giving myself the foundation, the, the firmware foundation to be able to create or take existing hardware that I have and make it into a logic analyzer, uh, particularly one that is very wide. So if I could do 32 lines at once, uh, I'd be able to do something like a uh, Game Boy cartridge. So Game Boy cartridges, they have a lot of pins on it. They have you know a 16-bit address bus and an 8-bit data bus, and then the control signals on top of that. And I haven't found a great way to like just capture all that data um, and be able to analyze it. The other piece is that um, Salier themselves really only support, uh, they only support their own software, which is fine. And they're, they're continuing to improve it. But uh, as a software person, I'd much prefer to work uh, or use software that I can then hack on and make better for myself. So um, my goal today is just straight up to like bring more exposure to SIGROC and talk a little bit about this project I'm call calling Tiny Logic Friend. Um, Logic Friend was a name that we actually, we prototyped this uh, previously with an Adafruit uh, and they called it Logic Friend. I added the tiny because I'm actually basing it on tiny USB. So um, logic analyzers at the very, very basic level, what they're doing is they're reading pins over and over and over, and then they're piping that data up a USB link or, or, or even a UART link to uh, a computer, which then can take that data and do higher level an analysis of it. Um, and so the goal with tiny logic friend is that we have this great... USB stack. Uh, let me switch back from my desk for just a moment. 
Um, if you don't know this, uh, TAC has tiny USB, which is an open source MIT licensed uh, cross platform USB stack for embedded Cortex M systems. Um, although we are going to have ESP32 S2 support, so that's extensa. So the, Cor the Cortex M doesn't actually matter. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm I, because there's that two sides of a, of a logic analyzer, they, they read the inputs of the pins and then spit it up the USB link. Uh, we can actually share all of the USB link side, regardless of what microcontroller you're running on. Um, so the other half is then how do you capture the data on the particular MCU that you're doing? Um, that's the gist of it. Tiny Logic Friend you can find right now as uh, github.com slash tannewt slash tiny logic friend. This is also not updated. This is just the very first um, push I did to the repo. At, during this stream, I'll push everything that I've done here. And in fact, uh, that's probably a good place to start because I actually have some pending work I should get committed. Uh, I think so. Um, let me do a little bit more intro. Let me just show you uh, the Salie stuff to to show you where I'm going with it. Um, and let's also just check. Yeah, YouTube's not coming up, which is fine. We've got eleven folks on Twitch. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you don't know, uh, our primary chat is on the Discord, uh, the Adafruit Discord server, which is adafru.it/discord. Uh, and we're in the live broadcast chat channel. So if you hop in late and have questions, uh, please direct it there. That's where I will see it. Um, let's just briefly show off Salie to, to, to put a visual thing to what we're trying to do. So what I'm going to do here is I have the Salie plugged in. And I might actually unplug this later because uh, I have a lot of USB stuff and they all suck down or they all generate a lot of data. I've got a hover cam here that's doing the overhead. I've got a webcam, uh, and I've got the Salie and the J Link, all sorts of stuff. So if the stream accidentally dies, that's why. Um, but let's just show off how the Salie works first, because Salies are really useful. So I'm just plugging in ground here, and then I'm going to plug in these three wires. Ignore the Metro for now. This is going to be what we developed Tiny Logic Friend on. Uh, but I've also got a Feather, Feather NRF 52840 that uh, earlier I just made uh, print out. Uh, this is an LIS 3DH. It's an accelerometer. Uh, and it's done over I squared C. So uh, what I'll just be doing is we'll be able to see the traffic between the, the NRF and the, and the LIS 3DH. So let's show that off. Let's open yet another program, which you can't see. So I plugged it in, and I'll plug in, before I switch the over overhead off, I'll plug this in as well. There's nothing exciting happening here. It's just going to run. Um, if I switch back to this, you can see I've now opened Logic, which is the software um, that Salie works with. And you'll notice here that they're actually working on a new version, which is cool. I'm happy to see them innovate. So what I'm doing here is the Salie is really awesome. It can uh, both do digital and analog. So you see here, it's kind of like a sine wave. That's because it can actually capture the analog aspects of the signals, not just the digital ones. Uh, with Tiny Logic Friend, I'm not doing that. Like. Uh, there's always a, ma a question of like how much resolution or how much uh, you can actually capture in terms of your signal. And I'm just going for the baseline. Like the, all of the signal integrity is fine. It's just a digital like software problem. I'm not going to worry about interference or any sort of thing um, because digital really is analog under the hood. Uh, for Tiny Logic, we're not going to worry about that. If you do need to worry about it, though, that's where something like the Salie stuff can be really, really helpful. Um, and the Salie also has this uh, sample rate uh, selection as well. And the Pro 16 can go up to 500 mega samples per second, uh, which is incredible and definitely not something we're going to be able to do. Um, so what I just did here 
is, as I showed earlier, there's 16 lines. And I happen to know that the two lines, well, maybe, I don't know which way I plugged it in. But there's three lines. You can't see it here. If I do this and scooch it over. There's three lines right here that I plugged in from the Salier. So I've selected those um, in here, which you can see as well. And just scooch it, ugh, scooch it over. Um, so now we've we've got these three lines, and our code should be running. So I'm just going to hit Start and capture a little bit, and we can see these tiny little pulses show up, and they're showing up. Kind of, it can tell you how far apart the pulses are. And I actually in the Circuit Python code that's reading the accelerometer, uh, I have a sleep that's one second long. So a, a logic analyzer is really helpful for con can like uh, confirming your timing is correct and now i'm scrolling the scroll wheel and i'm able to s zoom in on these three traces i only actually needed the two but because it's like a three header i didn't know which side of which two of the header i was going to do so i could turn uh seven off here now uh except now i got to capture it oh it's done here um so this is what the logic analyzer is producing for us and now we can see uh, some more interesting uh, facets of, of the signal. Um, what we're seeing here is this top line is one of the two wires. And the, the digital, digital, digital data is encoded with the voltage. Um, and then in a, that voltage is abstracted away uh, by the logic analyzer. It basically, like, there's two thresholds, and if they're below that, it's a zero. If it's above the other one, it's a one. Um, and that's what we've kind of boiled it down to. Uh, this is analyzing uh, an I squared C connection, which is uh, a shared bus. It's, a, it's kind of like, uh, it's a shared protocol for how a microcontroller can talk to another device. Um, and the advantage of I squared C and, uh, is that you can have more than one device on the same pair of wires, uh, and they can all talk at different times, but using the same pair of wires, which is really powerful. And it's actually very, very common on all of Adafruit's products. Um, so this is a really good target uh, for something like the Tiny Logic Friend, where we have lots of products that are I squared C, and there's lots of Python drivers and other drivers that there is logic about what commands go. Um, but by having a logic analyzer, you're able to actually tell that the commands went in the right order and verify things like that. Um, the other nice property of I squared C for something like a tiny logic friend is that it's actually quite a slow signal. Um, it's 400 kilohertz, which is really not that quick. Um, then again, <laughs> I haven't actually gotten it working, so I don't know for sure whether we're going to actually be able to pull this off. Uh, so I hope you didn't actually expect anything to come out of the stream. We may, we may just learn a lot and not be able to do it. So, uh, the advantages or the, the reason that I'm pretty confident we're going to be able to do it is that, uh, while here I'm trying on the SAMD 51, which is 120 megahertz, uh, there are some new chips coming down the line that are like 500 megahertz and that may make it easier to be able to do everything. So. Uh, if we can't do it on the SAMD51, we should be able to find another micro that we can do it on. Um, so this is what a logic analyzer looks at the basic level. Uh, but one thing that's cool is now you can do things like uh, actually interpret the different pieces of that uh, into a higher level constructs, like what data is actually being sent. So SDA is the data line. And I know that 6 is the data line because it's not always uh, moving. And the, the one that's always moving is the clock line. The clock line is used as a reference for like, when are the bits valid? Or when, when should the bits be read? So if I turn this analyzer on, now I can see things like, um, I never like that it's an ASCII. I think I should change that. But you, so uh, it tells you like the data that was sent and then the, uh, whether it was acknowledged or not. That's part of the I squared C protocol. And they've actually added like these uh, dots and stuff too. So setup read, so that's the address of the device it's looking for, and then this data. 
Um, and you can see that the clock line also has arrow up arrows on uh, the rising edge. And that's just to indicate which uh, side of the, the clock signal is actually valid. Okay. So SIGROC is great. Or not SIGROC. Salier is great. We're going to talk about SIGROC. Um, Salier is great, but it's actually pretty price prohibitive because they are really high quality devices that are used professionally. Um, the goal with Tiny Logic Friend is that you've, you're a native fruit fan or um, you have similar class hardware, you have something that Tiny USB supports. It'd be awesome if you could just load software onto the device you already have and use it as a very basic logic analyzer. Uh, because it's very, very helpful, right? Logic analyzers are giving us a view into the wire, the the wires of themselves and the data that's going over them. Um, so let's close that. Let's move away from Salier. I think I've kind of tried to sell that stuff enough already. Um, they're great. They're expensive, like hundreds of dollars. Um, but if that's the tool you need to do work, then it's well worth it. Um, my goal is for to provide something for beginners instead. So SIGROC's been around a while, and it is similar to the, the logic side, the software I just had open. That's kind of what SIGROC does. Then the question is, is what hardware do I have um, to use with SIGROC? And that's where Tiny Logic Friend comes in. So I'm going to unplug the Salier, which you can kind of see. And please like bug me in the Discord if uh, I end up talking about something that you can't see on screen. Uh, because I have this view, and then I also have this view where you can see more of my screen. Hey, thank you, TwitchBot. 24 minutes into the stream, and it says that I'm live. Oh, that was, does that mean YouTube's gone? No. OK, so uh, we're going to ignore that. I told you this was going to be like a live coding sort of thing. So let me just show off PulseView. So PulseView, SIGROC is the name of the, the broader project. Um, and the, there's a, a few components to it. One is the library itself. And the library itself is the code that interfaces with the devices. And then there's a SIGROC CLI, which allows you to uh, talk, take, talk to a device and then run uh, logic analysis or protocol analysis on top of that, all from the command line. And then there's also a thing called PulseView, which is kind of like the desktop windowed app uh, equivalent to... <laughs> uh, Og Ogre Drew says uh, they give TwitchBot a bot snack uh, for, for it saying that we're live streaming. Um, so there's uh, kind of two pieces that we're going to talk about, um, maybe three with Sigroc. Uh, the first is the library itself, and that's where the like negotiation between how the hardware talks over USB gets translated into the <laughs> translated into the standard formats uh, for the Sigroc processing on on that side, um, and then there's also the uh, like viewer side as well. So let me just show you, I, I did get this going. So I'm in my directory for uh, LibSigGrok here because I've actually modified it. Um, I had to modify it for the protocol that I was talking to Li Tiny Logic Friend. Um, but first, I just kind of want to show PulseView to compare it to this to the Salier stuff I just did. So we're started up here. And one thing that's interesting is it does actually have the Salier Logic Pro. It detects it. I'm not entirely sure that it uh, that it works. I haven't tried it. I think I tried it once and it crashed. So I'm actually gonna just ignore that. Um, just to show, let me just show Pulse View off here quickly. And to do that, I'm just gonna use the demo device, and I can just hit Run, and it generates some data for me. The viewer here, if I zoom in, uh, can actually view different types of analog waveforms. Um, and it can also view digital waveforms. Um, one thing that's kind of took me a while to realize, but the uh, the digital waveform is actually SIGROC, S-I-G-R-O-K. <laughs> I was like, oh, it would be really nice to be able to run a protocol analyzer on top of it, but it's actually just a, a visual represent 
representation of Sigrock. Um, but this is kind of where uh, my interest as a software person is, is that um, Sigrock comes with a bunch of decoders uh, for different protocols, uh, digital protocols. I don't know if they have any um, analog protocol analyzers, but basically what you could do, like we said, like, oh, this is I squared C, debug I squared C. Um, this actually has decoders for all sorts of different stuff. You can see here NES gamepad, which would be really neat. Um, but uh, I'm a firm believer if I'm going to put time into writing like decoders and stuff, I'd much prefer to do it uh, for open source software. So uh, I'm interested in moving my workflow over here where I can. Um, and you can see all sorts of different like sensors and stuff that they have decoders for. Uh, they won't work on this data because it's different data, but um, definitely interested in in getting support. I think the challenge, the hurdle that uh, Sigrock has kind of like had to get over is I don't think that they have a very easy way to get hardware access to everyone. I think the folks that are really into Sigrock are totally willing to buy the stuff uh, from AliExpress and things like that. Uh, but I'd love to see uh, readily available hardware in the U.S. be supported by Sigrock. So. That brings us to Tiny Logic, friend. Um, so, Tiny Logic, friend, is tiny USB based logic analysis software, logic analyzer software. It's not actually so. It's not doing any protocol level analysis. Its whole job is to sample pins and spit it up the USB link so that uh, on the host computer you can uh, get that data in and do that high level protocol analysis. So there's a couple ways of doing it. The basic challenge is that it's a lot of data. So a, lo uh, a logic analyzer tends to have just a sample rate. So you say, like I showed you briefly in Salia, you could say sample every 20, 20 mega samples or something. And what uh, the microcontroller will then do is it will set a timer and it'll say every n, n ticks of my clock, I will sample the pins and then I'll spit them up, up the USB link. That has a problem in that um, if your signal's not changing, you're still sampling it really high. So you have to have a good m match between the rate of the signal you're trying to sample and the, uh, and the, the rate that you're actually sampling the signal. Uh, one of the challenges with the SAMD51 uh, and the 21 and, and most of the boards that we support here at Adafruit is that they're all um, USB full speed, which is only 12 megabits per second, which is not a lot. And that's theoretical and that's shared with other devices. So one of the key things is like really reducing the amount of data you're sending over the, the USB link. One of that approach, one of those approaches to to uh, reducing the amount of data that you uh, send over the USB link is called run length encoding, where uh, what you do is you say, I have the sample, and it happened for this long, and and you send that just as one set of data, and then you say, okay, and then after that I had this sample and it was held on for that long, um, so that's the approach I'm taking, which means that. I can set a sample rate, sample rate at a high rate, and then whittle it down to basically every time the signals actually change, I take a snapshot. I I remember or think of how many samples that that previous one was valid, and then I send it up the USB link. I'm basically compressing it right from the get go. And the way that I'm hoping to do that again, I so. Up until this point, I think I've gotten the full thing working, but only with me pressing a button, which is like the slowest signal you can possibly imagine. <laughs> like humans are very slow signals. Um... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, Lady Ada says uh, she's going to start with a Sandy 51 Itsy Bitsy M4. And that's actually what I was kind of thinking is that that is the best way to do it. So um, last time I worked on this, a number of weeks ago, so I might be a little rusty on like how to get everything going. I would, I, if I remember right, I was able to press these buttons that I had next to uh, the metro and get the si signals into Sigrock going up and down. Um, 
And uh, I'm hoping today, in the next hour and a half, I can get I2C working. But 400 kilohertz is actually quite a lot. I was just looking at the Salie, and it's sub one microsecond. So that a microsecond is one megahertz, and we're running 120 megahertz, which means we have 120 instructions for every one microsecond of time that we see there. So it's going to be tight. <laughs> so I, I make no promises. I make no promises that, it, that this is going to work. Uh, we do, again, like I said earlier, we have an out and that we have faster microcontrollers coming down the pike. Uh, but we'll see. The other option is that uh, because we're assuming that you're doing digital debugging, you could actually just slow I squared C down uh, because it does work slower. Uh, so if we can't keep up with the timing, we can always slow things down to be able to keep up with it. Um, so let's get in the weeds. This is called a deep dive for a reason, because that's where I like to take us. Um, the way that I have it working is that because we only have 120 cycles, <laughs> thank you. We'll see if I can can uh, have your faith. Ogre Drew says we have faith in you, Tandu. Hopefully. Um, so we talked about the limit of the bandwidth. So how many megabits can we send over USB? We have to also think about the amount of data that we can get through the CPU and the memory buses in the CPU and in the microcontroller and like basically like everything there as well. So the microcontroller is 120 megahertz. It's going to be both sampling pins and it's going to be doing work on the USB side. So the least the less we can do on the CPU itself, the better. So the way that I've sketched this out working is basically I want to do that run length encoding from the very, very beginning. And the way that I'm going to do that is I was looking through the data sheet, which I've looked through for years. And I was looking at, and that's what I have pulled up. You can see it. Um, microcontrollers have this notion of an interrupt, which says, which is a way for a peripheral, which you can think kind of similar to how the LAS 3DH is independent to the feather. You can think of it that same way. Peripherals are separate things in the same uh, piece of silicon that run independently. And an interrupt is a way to, for one thing running independently to say to the CPU, hey, something's happening. You should be aware of it. And I was looking, 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 looking. Basically, what I want, what I want to do, because I want to run length and code from the very beginning, is I want to only get CPU time when things are changing uh, because that's when I want to when I have to add a new sample and the way that I can keep track of when things uh, when things change is there's this external interrupt controller which is used for the very similar thing to what I just talked about where the LAS 3DH could have a pin that says I'm an interrupt to the microcontroller and the external interrupt controller is a way to translate that external wire into an interrupt into the CPU itself. Um, and it does some pr pretty cool things. Like it actually can filter. So if there's a little bit of noise, you might actually jump up to one, back down to zero, and back up to one, one again. And the external interrupt controller uh, can actually do what this is talking about, which is take three samples. And only when those three samples are uh, kind of consistent will uh, it be zero or one, which is super cool. And the reason that I can't do this on the SAMD2021 20, is that there's this register. So registers are kind of like memory locations that you use to speak from the CPU to a peripheral. Um, there's this one called pin state. And pin state is the state of all the interrupt pins uh, after it's been filtered. So not only do we, so we can read all the pins from the, <laughs> uh, we can get the filter data from all of the external interrupt pins. There are up to 16 on the SAMD51. So note that uh, with this approach on the SAMD51, we're not going to be able to be wider than the Salia is. I've already looked at the IMXRT, though, and I think I can get wider there, which is great because it also has high-speed USB. Um, and then the other thing what we can do 
using the external interrupt controller is it also has, the, I think it's the sense register, right? And it can detect both edges. So this is a very common thing of notion of like, instead of knowing whether some, like digital logic is almost not lows versus highs, it's, it's rising edges and falling edges. The transitions between those are what actually cause data to change uh, in a lot of cases. So the external interrupt ha has this notion of, I can trigger something or I can sense when either edge happens. Whew. Welcome to the weeds. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to join us on the Discord. Uh, it's adafru.it slash Discord. Um, I don't know if folks are dropping in or not or in or out or whatever. Um, so if you have questions or if you've been watching and you have questions, just let me know. Uh, happy to answer them. <laughs> uh, Lady Ada is asking uh, which pins to use from port A. Um, so the way that the, it doesn't matter which port you're on, Lady Ada. Uh, what matters is that the mapping between pins and the external interrupts is based on the, um, the, the pin number. So if we look at the, uh, Mr. Certainly also asked for a link to the data sheet. And I can do that. Here's the microchip page. I just searched for it and I hit view data sheet. <laughs> um, there are a lot of different uh, numbers, but it doesn't actually matter. They all go through like a generic SAMD51 one. But I'll drop that in Discord. Yep. And it might actually be a newer version. I have I don't know when they last re revised it. This is a copy that I store locally because it's easier to just open it up again. Um, I was talking about pin muxing because Lady Ada was asking me about it. She's currently like actively designing a piece of hardware to go with this. So I hope it gets, I hope we get it working. Um, but what we can see here is that, uh, oh, I was not super correct. No, I was, I was okay. So if I, let me make this bigger because it's quite small. Um, this is the big pin matrix and there's a number of different pin names. Let me just explain. Whoa. <laughs> uh, there we go. That'll work. Uh, let me just kind of explain the top left portion of this table. So uh, pad names are the names that are on the die itself, the piece of silicon that's inside of it. Um, and they have things like PB03. Um, and that's kind of a standard name across kind of all the different sizes and shapes of the chips. Of the, of the packaging. So the packaging is then these five different options. VQFN is the smallest one that you can see the things on the outside, and that's what you'll get on something like uh, the Itsy Bitsy. Um, and these numbers here, like 48, 64, 100, are, are the number of pins that are actually broken out um, from the piece of silicon to the like uh, pads and pins on the, on the package itself themselves. I won't go into too much detail about that. Um, but that is this is this chart is really helpful to go from which pin on the package to what is the internal name because the internal name then impacts how it's connected to the rest of the microcontroller. Um, and what we can see here is that like PB03 is connected to the external interrupt line three. So when you're picking pins for something like this, basically what you want to do is you want to pick as many different numbers of the external int here, which usually maps to 0, 3. Now, there's only 16 lines into the external interrupt. So if you have a number that's higher than 15, scroll, 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 <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, we can see that like PA19 is actually back to external interrupt 3 again. So uh, when picking pins, you want to make sure that uh, you only pick one of each of these 
things. And yeah, I would expect that the first 16 pins of PA are unique because I think it really is the number number mod 16. Um, but it can get pretty tricky. So uh, that's the way that it works. OK, so let's talk code and try to actually get going because we're 45 minutes in and I haven't compiled. Well, I did compile something, but I didn't really tell you that. Um, so this is Sublime. And if I need to make the font bigger, just let me know. I'll figure out how to do that. Uh, Sublime's a text editor. Um, here you can see the code that I'm actually running on the circuit, uh, the circuit Python running on the NRF52840. Uh, it's just this. So I'm just connecting to LIS3DH and doing one read and then sleeping. Uh, I, sl I changed it to sleep for a long time to hopefully give me enough time to like buffer, 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 and then get all the USB data out. So we'll see. Um, OK, so I have so I have a folder for SIGROC. And SIGROC is divided into like serial port drivers, uh, SIGROC, SIGROC to code. So that's all the protocol decoders. And then the two ways to interact with SIGROC, PulseView, which is the window version, and SIGROC CLI, which is the connect to the logic analyzer, run these decoders, and just spit out the output onto the, onto the command line. Um, those are all pieces of the SIGROC, SIGROC project. And I'm not going to go into how to set it up because, frankly, I did it a long time ago, and I don't really remember. <laughs> but um, there's information on SIGROC.org, and I also found this file that was really helpful uh, in SIGROC util which is uh, SIGROC native Mac OS X, which is just like a bunch of commands on how to set everything up to run and work together on OS X, which I'll just drop a link to. Yeah, would you like me to resize, Drew? Is, is it too small? Uh... I don't know it very well. I tried just the font larger. Command boss. I'm in the big screen. Oh, that'll help a little bit. It probably, hopefully, it means that I like sit back and don't have such terrible posture. Um, OK, so I'm not going to talk about this quite yet. I'm not going to talk about the SIGROC side of things. First, I want to talk about the tiny logic friend side of things and the way I have, I have it set up. So the idea is that we're building on top of tiny USB, um, which actually means that we get some really cool things. We get like per board sort of compiles already for free. And uh, we get all the USB stuff. So I'm kind of acting like a. Uh, I'm acting like a uh, an example, like a tiny USB example, but I'm actually like putting all the example code outside of tiny USB. If we look here in the tiny logic friend repo, I've actually just got this lib folder that has tiny USB in it um, that I'm kind of like hooking into. So uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. the reason I think I, I kind of like doing this in my spare time is that it's not CircuitPython, which means I can like really focus on what it's doing. So uh, here's the main. <laughs> if you've ever looked at CircuitPython's code, it's not that simple. Uh, it's much more complicated. Uh, but we're doing basic things like uh, get everything going and then forever run the tiny USB stuff, capture some stuff, at, or this is like more post-process stuff, and then run more USB stuff and then finish. Um, let's see. There's some Blink stuff that I just left in there. Um, CDC task. This is actually reading commands from the computer, uh, telling it like, like when SIGROC starts up, it says like, hey, what am I connected to? And it gets some metadata uh, from the device. One thing I thought we could work on if I feel like it and, um, and we have time is uh, one thing I'd like to do is the device itself should know the name of all the pins. So uh, if you have like a random feather, uh, we can pick the pins that work all together. We talked about picking all the different in external interrupt lines. Um, 
basically we can encode that in the firmware that we give you. And then when you pull it up, it'll be weird. It will say like the first eight things are like D6 and D4 and D5 and like totally out of order, but those will match the pins on the feather, um, which is an approach we've taken with CircuitPython and has worked really well. Um, so that's one thing we could do here. Uh, for now, I, I'm not doing that, I don't think. And then um, I had this generic Q sample, which is taking in a sample and the sample length. So uh, the sample is like the pin state at a particular time. And then sample length is how long um, that occurred before the, the sample itself changed again. Uh, we'll, we'll dig into that just a bit. And then I'm just writing that out over CDC, which is like serial. So that's main. And the nice thing about that is that that would be shared with everything. Um, so that would not have to change per microcontroller that we support with Tiny Logic Friend. Um, this bit, the logic capture.c file, is within MCU, microchip, SAMD, blah, blah. And the reason it's in there is because that's where. Um, this is what will change with the different chip families that we support. So we have init, and we're doing some things like uh, initializing clocks. So um, the CPU itself is running, but all those peripherals that are on the chip too don't necessarily run until you actually uh, turn them on. And the way that you turn them on is you actually give them a clock signal, because that clock signal starts all the logic running. So um, what we're doing here is we're there's two sets of clocks for peripherals on this AMD21. There's the clocks that clock the uh, the ability to actually read and write to the registers to those things. Um, that's called the APB bust. Uh, so this is APBA mask. And what we're turning on is the EIC, the external interrupt controller. And we're also turning on TC0, which is timer counter, I think is what it stands for. So the general gist of what we're going to do is we are going to um, turn on interrupts. So whenever one of those pins changes, right, either edge, we'll get an interrupt and we'll call this EIC handler that we have at the top here. Um, and then what we'll do is we use TC0 as our reference clock. So TC0 is really just counting. So it's one, two, three, four, and it's counting uh, based on the clock that we're giving it. So um, what we're hooking it up to, we're hooking them both up to a 48 megahertz clock. So um, that's what you could consider the sample rate that we're running at. Although every time we're, th we're not actually taking a sample every time that uh, that 48 megahertz clock happens. What we're doing is instead we're saying EIC run at 48 megahertz. So it's doing the filtering and then it will say, oh, I got something. Um, <laughs> oh. Ogre Drew asks, TC0 is where Arduino gets millis, right? I don't know. I don't, I've never really done Arduino. Um, but something like that, uh, for sure. Like, you you derive uh, clock data from from clocks. <laughs> it's not very helpful. Uh, yeah, there's lots of, there's lots of stuff, uh, lots of TCs. So, like, uh, the SAMD, if we look in our data sheet, um, I recommend, this is just preview on Mac, uh, I don't think we need the 32 kilohertz crystal. Yeah, we would. Well, we can't. The SAMD51 USB sync doesn't work. So. Uh, but yeah, I don't think we need it because I think the 48 megahertz one is pretty good. And we're not going for high accuracy clocks. Like. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, we don't really care if the time's that well. The thing we're trying to debug is like you ran the wrong command, right? Like you sent the wrong data. That's the thing that's most important for us. Um, and that's important. That's how we're gonna get something low cost and, and uh, easy to use. So yeah, timer counter. So this is the, uh, this is the peripheral. And uh, as you can see in the first line, there's up to eight copies of it. They live at different memory addresses, but they work basically the same. Um, there can be differences. You have to read the details, but they're gen they're generally the same. So I just picked TC0 because I don't have to worry about everything that we worry about with CircuitPython. 
circuit by them will be much smarter so like if if you say let me do pwm out and it will try to f look between all eight tcs and decide which one to use for you in this case we're being we're doing the opposite with tiny logic friend we're trying to be very specific about what we're using and we're doing one thing and we're trying to do it as well as we can okay so that's what init does is that we're turning stuff on that we're going to use so the first thing we turn on is the clocks to the registers and then we turn on the clocks to the devices themselves and we can pick like which ch which generic clock it's derived from i happen to know g clock one is 48 megahertz uh i don't know when that gets going but let's ignore that um the other thing so let's talk about start so start we're going to do a soft reset of both the external internal controller and the tc0 we wait for them to finish and then uh, right now i just hard-coded what pin we're using <laughs> i told you it was early um and the pin i'm using is actually d13 on the metro m4 because i wanted to be able to see that the light goes off off and on uh, because that's the one the LED's on. So here's the lowest level thing to turn on. Um, so the port peripheral is another peripheral that controls, you know, digital in and out. There's a register called uh, write config, which is just a way to write config. You can't read stuff from it. Um, I don't... Oh, HW select is half word select because we're writing more bits than can fit so you have to tell it are you the first 16 or the second 16 uh confirm that we're going to write to it we're going to write to the pmux we're going to write to pmux zero and pmux n is that and then this is the mask for which pin we're dealing with um it's one because we're in the second half word so that would be the you know 16 mod 16 it must be plus one. I don't know. Uh, the PMUX is uh, the port peripheral can connect an outside, a pin from the outside to a bunch of different things on the inside. Um, so when we were looking at the table for... This is kind of good. I haven't done a talk about this before. Um, it is the weeds, but these are weeds that I don't know how often people have shown. Uh, on here, it's A. And this, this directly correlates to like which uh, PMUX value you're talking about. So if you wanted to connect PB3 to the analog pin, you would say uh, PMUX1, so 0, zero 1, CIRCOM 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. Um, that's how you change what a pin does is, is with PMUX. And now we're setting up async, or we're setting up the external interrupt controller, we're setting all the pins to async. We're setting all of them to a particular, I think, rising and falling edge configuration. Uh, int, int and set is enabling an interrupt. So um, we talked about interrupts earlier as a way for like something over here to tell something over there, like, hey, something important is happening. And that happens even within the microcontroller itself. So the external interrupt controller, you can say uh, there's a bit to say, what should leave the peripheral and then there's also configuration on the on the microcontroller side of what to listen to and we'll talk about that just a bit um turning on debouncing this is a filtering i was talking about and then we're enabling the peripheral um we're also going to use tc0 so we turn it on to 16 bit mode we say hey let us know if you overflow so if the signals are so far apart uh, we may actually want to just like um, raise a raise our hand and say like, oh, the sample's the same, but it lasted for a full uh, 16 bits of time. Um, and then we take our first sample. So the NVIC is the thing that I was just talking about on the microcontroller side. So this is the thing that takes incoming signals from all the different peripherals, and you can enable which ones you want. Um, and then I'm also, so I'm, I'm enabling the interrupts for TC0, and I'm also enabling all of the interrupts for the uh, external interrupt controller. And then lastly, I start the clock. So that's logic, logic capture start. And the idea now is that everything's running. 
we're monitoring pins, the one pin in this case that we're looking at, and any time we see a rising or a falling edge, uh, that triggers an external interrupt, interrupt which is here. Um, the SAMD21 has different interrupt lines for each individual pin, uh, but this, uh, with these 16 functions, we're just driving it back down to one. So this isn't the best way to do it because it takes some time between when that thing interrupts and when the CPU actually gets to it. But again, we're not going for perfect, we're going for good enough. Um, so when a pin changes, the very first thing we do is we capture the pin state of the external interrupt controller. If the pins change too fast, this might actually be wrong, but we're, I'm hopeful, fingers crossed, that uh, the state is the same by the time we get here. Um, so we capture the pin state, we uh, turn off the interrupts, and then we start to read the time on the counter uh, because that's our reference clock. That will tell us how many, how much time has passed since last time. Um, <laughs> and now what we're doing is we're saying, uh, oh, okay, sample length is wrong. I was wrong. So TC0 count 16 count uh, is resetting the time. So this is how we are keeping track of the, the time between pin things. And now we're um, logging. So it's four bytes. So every time an edge changes, we're going to log four bytes. Four bytes is really convenient. Four bytes is great because that's also 32 bits, uh, which is the kind of the largest unit of data that can happen in one cycle within a 32-bit microcontroller. So we use the first 16 bits for the timestamp, which is how long since the last value. And we use the remaining 16 bits for all of the actual state on the external internet controller. Um, so theoretically, going from the one that I have configured here to two should be pretty easy. We just connect to the external internet controller and cross our fingers. OK, so that's how it works. We should see if it works. Um, we can talk about the SIGROC side in a little bit, but let's just get things going here. You can kind of see what I'm doing. So the way that I have my streaming set up is like, I have a giant monitor and you're only seeing like the top left corner, which is why I'm like, let me know if you can't see stuff. Cause I can see it. You just can't. Uh, I've got some tabs open here. If I connect to USB modem, blah, 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 you can see this is the circuit Python script that's reading the LIS3DH, uh, but I don't care about that. Um, I'm actually, so when I'm developing, especially in this case where it's low level, low level, let me just explain my setup. I wrote a learn guide about this. Uh, let's just do this. So, um, off screen, up this way, I have a USB hub. The USB hub has the JLink base connected to it. The JLink base is connected giant cable, adapter board to small cable onto the Metro M4. This is really handy because it allows you to load code without any bootloader on it. Um, lots of you have probably used the UF2 bootloader, but this actually uh, circumvents that. And this is actually how you get it on the chip in the first place as well. And then I've got a USB cable here. This is a special cable I got from my old work, which has a button on it. And that button allows me to connect and disconnect the data lines. When it does that, it actually blips the power, which is bad because then we lose our connection to the microcontroller. But I've got uh, this here, which is power separate. And we're not using the Salia, it's just in here. Um, so first, uh, to use this, I, I have a learn guide. Somebody can find it um, on this whole setup. So this is definitely where I start. There we go. Debugging the SAMD21 with GDB. This is a SAMD51, but it's essentially the same process. The only thing that's different is this device name, which you can't see because I'm on the overhead. Let's move away from the overhead. So I'm going to start the JLink GDB server, which is connecting over the 
the small wires from the J Link into directly into the the microcontroller. And I've got this tab. This is my SIGROC tab for building SIGROC and stuff, so I'm not going to work there. What I am going to do is I'm going to work in this tab here for the tiny logic friend. And I'm going to run GDB, which is ARM, something like that. Uh, do, 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 do. All of my all of my commands are for like uh, for Circuit Python. So now we've connected. We can see this is the current program counter. This is where in our instructions the CPU is, and we should rebuild. So we can do one thing that uh, most people don't know is you can actually run make is so common that uh, GDB allows you to just run make from within GDB, it just like shells out to it and runs it for you. So uh, I'm actually just going to clean, which deletes the directory. And then I'm going to build it with debug on. Should be quick. It's not as big as CircuitPython. And then I can load. So that loaded the code for tiny logic friend onto the Metro. And let's see, I need a wire. If only I had wires. Too many wires. All right, let me, you can see what I'm doing, kind of. Let's see what is in the way. There we go. Okay, so as I have it now, I'm sorry if I bump my mic with my head, but I can't see it. So I'm gonna plug in D13, and I'm gonna just plug it into uh, SDA, and let's see what happens. Which is kind of interesting. Um, the red light is also there. I wonder if we can actually see. Oh, you know, we're, we're probably going to screw it up if we do that. Okay, let's change that. Let's make it D12. So the one thing we have to be aware of is, like, if on the LED, we're actually, like, potentially changing the voltage levels because the LED has power to it. So I just changed it from D13 to D12, so we're going to actually have to change our pin configuration right now. <laughs> Lady eight is way ahead of me. I was thinking we would use the the two by fives actually, because you could do eight eight bits plus power and ground with two by fives, which I think would be cool. Ooh. Yeah, I'm not really worried about noise. I don't think we're going to get to that point, but maybe. You're the hardware person. <laughs> I really hope this works. This is just, this is a hobby, a hobby thing for me so far. Um, okay, so let's change the pin. It's going to be tedious right now, but the idea is that later we'd be able to like hard code them all. Um, so this says uh, D13 on the Metro M4 is PA16. So let's just add ourselves another note that says D12 on the Metro M4 is, how do we figure that out? <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping I can do 400 kilohertz. I'm not even confident I can do that. Uh, what was I gonna pull up? Oh, I was gonna pull up GitHub. So uh, CircuitPython has a pin mapping, which is really handy. So we'll do ports at MLSMT, and then boards, and we're on the Metro M4. Later on, we'll have these in uh, in Tiny Logic Friend. So if you want to help with that, let me know. Ah, perfect. But this is the mapping in CircuitPython between D12 and PA17. So all we have to do here is 
say P A 17, which is EXTI1, I believe. And this probably changes to a two. <laughs> we can double check that. Let's just, but since we're learning data sheets, or it, I'm, I'm turning out to, uh, what did I get myself into? Look, yeah, I know. Right. You know, you know when you hit on a good idea when Lady Eight is like, "Oh yeah, let's do that right now." <laughs> I don't know if we've ever told the story of how Express Boards came to be, but it was Phil, Lady, and I, Phil, Lady Ada, and I having, um, yeah, we're all stuck indoors. Uh, we were having a meeting between the three of us, and we were talking about the Feather M Zero. And I remember saying like, oh, we should just throw a spy flash on there and we can store all our, all our stuff there. And the next day, Lady Ada had laid it all out. <laughs> like she's like, okay, here's the hardware. And we're like, okay, that's, you know, it's a, you know, you have a good idea when Lady Ada picks up on it and does it the next day. So yeah, I mean, this is good if we're making hardware. Okay, so I'm looking for PA17. I just want to make sure that the external interrupt line is what I think it is. Yep, so it's one here. And then this random thing here, let's just double check what that means. So let's go, uh, ag again, like this is a PDF viewer that has table of contents. Uh, that is really nice. What is the bus pirate pinout for the two by five? I'd be curious. Um. I guess I can drag this over. I don't think there's anything you can't see. Here's the discussion. Um, oh, but I wasn't thinking that though. I was thinking we have just eight generic pins because that's got two power rails on it. Ground, three volts, five volts. Okay. Back behind the curtain you go, Discord. PDF view is running off the bottom of right edges. Yeah. And I have the... Let me switch to this. Ba -da -da. Thank you for the heads up, Drew. Okay, so we just wanted to double check what we're doing for WR config. So the table of contents is awesome. So we're looking for port, which is the peripheral that we're using. And it's here somewhere. 32. And then uh, on the Sandy chips, you can get a reg or register summary which will give you an overview of all the registers and uh, WR config. And it explains how they're assembled into groups. And pin mask here shows you, ah, that's why. So it was one before because we, we were bit zero. And now by changing it to two, we were bit one. So that is what we want. And later we can turn it on for more stuff, but for now we're just gonna do the one. And let's rebuild and reload. And what we can do is one of my favorite debugging tricks, which Dan knows because sometimes I accidentally leave it in the code, is to just drop, uh, there's a way to do breakpoints from C code. And in fact, we could just break on it. So. We know we've connected the pin from the outside world to the EIC correctly, and we're plugged into the data line, which should be going, if this EIC handler is called. So let's just do break EIC handler uh, load. So we've loaded it on. Let's reset and run it. And <laughs> nothing happens. Great. This is why we're testing it. 
Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Ground three three volts and then eight pin bus. I was actually thinking for logic shifting, you could actually have something on the other end. So like I have some old piano keyboards like Yamaha keyboards that I want to interface with. What they would have is a custom PCB that went from their connectors shifted from five volts to the three three volts coming over the two by five. Um, that's what I was thinking. So like the logic shifting would be on the other end. But yeah, I don't know. Okay, so this didn't work. <laughs> So the other way we could do it is we could do it this way. Oh, this is why. It, it doesn't work because we're not connected to it. So when I was first developing it, I would actually, I would actually just have it start always. But I think I got it far enough where it doesn't do that. So let's just delete that breakpoint. Well, let's see what breakpoints you have. You do info. You can say delete one. Let's mon reset. And let's just see if we continue. Our power is on. I'm going to switch to the overhead view as well. Maybe you can see that I'm reaching towards it at least. So I'm going to click the USB cable just so that the data lines are connected. And if I ls dev tty USB, we can see there is a dev tty USB modem TLF 1234561. <laughs> totally random serial number. No. You know, just happened to get one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, that's good. So we are connected. And uh, so I showed Pulse View. Let's not jump to Pulse View quite yet. Um, I mean, we could. We could see if it works. Let's see if it works. <laughs> I was going to try Sigrox CLI as the alternative. Um, right now, it can't automatically detect the devices there. That's something I would work on later if if need be. Um, but for now, what we can do is we can choose our driver. And Tiny Logic Friend is in here. I haven't talked much about this yet, but it's there. We can talk about it in a bit. Uh, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna choose that USB modem from the thing. And I'm gonna hit scan. And it says device name with four channels. <laughs> Neither of those are true. Uh, but yeah. So that is, if we look at the serial output here, um, it actually did talk to, uh, it did talk to the Tiny Logic firmware stuff. Now you may be wondering why is it returning something called FPGA firmware? Well, I didn't start from scratch. I started from the Open Logic sniffer, which has an FPGA on it, and it happens to have a pick on it as well. So uh, that's where I started from. But I been kind of like transforming and mutating uh, the control signals and uh, command signals from there uh, because I I have to if I want to do things like I want to return the names of all the pins from the device itself so that you can very similar to how CircuitPython works you go to a downloads page it's got a big grid of all of the boards that we support you download the one for the board you have you copy the UF2 file over, you plug it in, Sigrock shows it, it shows you the pins that you need to use. Like they don't make sense because like they're random D ones, um, but they're usable and they're well named. So you know what you need to do. So uh, let's hit okay and just see what happens. <laughs> Something happened? Oh no, it doesn't stop. <laughs> I must not have implemented stop. Okay, let's control C this if we can, which we can't. Software, it's hard. Kill all pulse view. still going <laughs> oh no 
It's supposed to only go... <laughs> Let me take it off. It's doing something. You know what? I could unplug it. That'll do it. <laughs> yeah, beach balls are no fun. Hey, it's back. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't know if it's ever going to stop asking me whether I want to save a date or not. I really like to see it now that I, like we got something out of it. Ooh, it stopped. All right, let's look at this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That probably means nothing. It looks inverted to me, which is interesting. Um. <laughs> this is what I get for picking the data line. So if we had done the clock line, we should be able to see it go up and down at a regular interval. Whereas this is not. And we can't trust the times here either because these are just based on timestamps that I've been doing. Does it look regular? It looks pretty regular. But yeah, I have no idea if that's right or not. It certainly doesn't look like what we saw on the Salier. Um, hmm. What should our next step be? I think, yeah, we can close it. Well, that's good to know. We just unplug it. <laughs> I don't know why it didn't stop. It might be that we're just overwhelming it and it was getting behind. So, oh, that's the other thing. So every time it overflows, it's going to send a sample. So what we got, what it's telling us that we got is it received sample two and a sample count of 655, 535, which is 16 bits of value. The sample two is the same thing over and over and over again. I'm trying to remember. So we're sleeping for a while. Actually, let's try it. Um, I think I also have a Sigrox CLI, yeah. So this should crash because it's not connected. Let's just go back to JLink and, oh, <laughs> we hit a, a breakpoint. That will also cause it to stop responding. So let's see, you can't see that. It's main 198. So this is whether we accidentally overflowed or we failed to send something in tiny USB, which we should be able to do, but maybe not. Let's just comment that out. <laughs> Let's just play around until we have a better idea what we're doing. Make again. Riveting content, I know. So we're loaded. Let's reset and continue. Let's click the USB. Back on and run the Sigrox CLI and see what we get. We get something. I think it is supposed to stop after eight seconds. Doesn't look like like we're still running on the tiny logic run side. But this is continuing to go. Oh, did it stop? No, I just stopped the Maybe that's the first order of business to get it to actually stop. 
So let's see. What it's printing out is, I guess we could talk about the other side of it. Since that's primarily what we're doing, we're almost an hour and a half in. And yes, turn it off and back on again. The other thing we could try is we could actually try doing both lines at the same time, um, just to see what happens. To see if we see any sort of pattern with the clock line. Or we could just also try to do the clock line. Clock lines are usually the the right way the right place to start because they're predictable. All right. Turning off USB. I'm setting this. I'm not sure whether I can do multiple captures in a row. On reset and continue. Click USB on. And run Sigrock CLI again. Takes a little while because it actually rebuilds the library. And we'll control C it. And we're still getting all ones. Which is not really. We're getting all ones, but we're not the clock signal only goes when we're reading it. When we're um when the circuit python device is actually reading it. That's what I mean. So it's I th I think the clock signal idles low. So I don't no, it doesn't idle low. It idles high. So this is okay. Um it's totally possible that we're just we're working, but we're only working when um, in the like one second interval that we wait. So we could actually, we still have our circuit Python drive and we have our code. We can actually, let's just speed this up. Let's see if we can't actually figure out where that, that clock signal is. Right, so the way that I squared C works is like the default line is always high, and that's how that's how it works with um, multiple things on the same thing. Is that there's a resistor that makes the default value high, and then if any one thing on the bus makes it low, it's okay if another thing tries to make it low at the same time. Um, the thing you're trying to avoid is when one thing's trying to make it high uh, directly, and one thing's trying to make it low directly. That's a short circuit. Um, Okay, let's do one more round of off reset run. Turn on USB and let's just try it one more time. And did I wait long enough? Maybe I didn't wait long enough. So these are actually uh, debug messages, I think. <laughs> so if we actually hit a clock thing, we should see more debug messages as well. And I can talk about that in just a bit. I'm just curious, curious, curious. Or whether we're just idling all the time. The other thing we could do is we could see... So there's kind of two ways that packets get sent. There's the like timer overflowed out, out of 16 bits. That means that like nothing's happening, but we were, we overflowed. So we just say like, oh, this happened for the, for the 16 bits worth of time. Then the other thing is the external interrupt controller, which we tried to break on, which is the actual like, oh, a pin changed, do something. And that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out right now is like, it looks okay. But are we only doing the first thing and not the second thing? Are we only sampling it on the overflow? Or are we also sampling when we actually see pin activity? That's the question. Da, da, da. 
Like this all looks pretty standard. The problem is, is that right now, or as of when I was working on this last, Sigrock didn't preserve like run length encoding through the whole pipeline. So when I read something in and it says it's, you know, 65,000 long, I just like send further down the Sigrock pipeline, like 65,000 copies of, of that sample. Which is not not great. I don't see anything. I'm trying to think of if there's a better way to try to find it. Cause I don't know like is it gonna be a one zero one? Could I like just find it that way? Or something else? Hmm. I wonder if I could get it to turn off the bit values. Because I'm really just looking at the debug output. I don't need to look at the pin values. Nice. <laughs> My mom texted me. See, like this is this is what I'm expecting to see more of. This is saying, "Oh, I got sample," and oh, <laughs> oops, I got a sample and it's sixty-five thousand long. So let's just abuse everything a little bit more. And we'll unclick this. And let's do that breakpoint that we had. So the question is, is like, are we actually connected to the external in our controller? So we actually do have to run the SIGROC thing. And if my camera blips, I'm sorry. <laughs> Everything on the same USB bus is, can be dangerous. So no, it doesn't look like that's the case. Because this should be breaking if we're actually tracking, if we're actually getting an ex external interrupt controller alert or interrupt. Which would explain why we're just getting a bunch of the same thing over and over and over and over again. But it does look like it's connected up. Hmm, let me show you the overhead. Oh yeah, look at that video is not happy. Uh, control C. Wow. Hmm. Okay, so I don't think this is interesting. Just go to the overhead and just check my wiring. Maybe I'll think. D12 to SCL. So maybe we're connected to the wrong pin or I squared C is not actually running anymore. So what we could do is <laughs> use a logic analyzer to develop a logic analyzer hook the CLEA back up and we can just confirm that it is still running. <laughs> Debugging is so much fun to watch on Twitch, isn't it? Yeah, so that's what we expect. Try echoing pin state to toggle the LED inside the EIC controller and metro to verify. Yeah, Todd, I that makes sense to me, but like, wouldn't we like we should break on the external interrupt controller um, if we're actually getting to it? The other thing we can do is we can put a like assembly breakpoint instruction in there as well to know 
Um, but at least we know that the clock, the clock is running and it's on the right. Echoing. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could do the. Yeah, let me try the breakpoint thing. Like, I have a breakpoint here now. The other thing I can do is uh, in main where I'm waiting to run, like I'm waiting to get a command to run. I can do this and just run it always. So we don't have to like click and unclick the USB all the time. I can just make sure that, oh, sorry. There's my screen again. So I've added logic capture start, meaning that like we're just gonna go straight into it even if the USB is not there, which would explain why we would hit the other the breakpoint. Let's USB is unclicked. Could be like I'm loading circuit python on it or something. <laughs> I don't think that's it, but did I forget to run load? That could be it too. Not getting to the EIC handler. Oh yeah, Todd. Todd says, uh, "Better hurry, Scott. Looks like it, Lady Eight is gonna have the board done and shipped in a few hours." And I, like, that's my life. Is keeping up with Lady Eight of making new hardware. It's not surprising to me at all. <laughs> it's a good place to be. Yes, we are a team. I mean, that's when that, so the pitch with Tiny Logic Friend, right, is like, she pays me to make software that works across all of Adafruit's hardware and people should buy Adafruit hardware. Like, it sounds like a good deal to me. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, we got to figure out why this isn't working. So let me show you another trick that is not in my guide that I've been meaning to update. Uh, there's this thing called Pytex Cor Py Cortex M debug. Let me find a link to drop in the chat. Um, and GDB actually runs Python inside of it, which is cool. And then this is a thing that allows you to load up an SVD file, which is a definition of all the registers in the microcontroller that the vendors provide, and actually look at the contents of the registers relatively easily. Um, so there's the link. And so what I just did is I, I have, um, in my GDB init stuff, I have like shortcuts to load particular files. Um, like this is just happens to be where I put this SVD file. Uh, but now that it's loaded, I can do something like SVD EIC. And now I can look at all the registers and their values. I can look at control A and see that it's enabled, which is good. I can see that um, there is an external interrupt active. Where are we? So, and int n set. Ah, I think this is our problem. <laughs> Mr. Certainly says, I'm really enjoying this sort of deep dive. It's absolutely out of my depth, but being a fly on the wall and picking up little things that will benefit me later. Yeah, kind of that's the hope is that it's kind of like the way I stream is like, welcome to my world. This is the, the weeds in the deep end. Um, but it's recorded. You can go back and watch it again. I mean, it's 
two hours of detailed stuff, but it's like stuff that's not well documented. And I'm not a great writer, so this is a one way I can just uh, document it is just like sit on my shoulder, be a fly on the wall, and see what it's doing. So, um, so I think this is the issue that we're seeing here. Yeah, and and Lady Ada says the best part of streaming is debugging. So, uh, welcome to my my workflow for debugging. This is the same workflow I would use if I were working on like Spy on Circuit Python. This is all the same, all the same idea. Like SVD is really useful for that too. Um, but the thing that jumps out at me is that um, when it comes to interrupts, int flag is the active interrupts, and then int set and clear define uh, what interrupts go to the CPU. Now, these values are different. Not These two are one, but this is two. So I think what happens is when I shifted the pins from uh, like the zeroth one to the, to the one, the first one, or the second one, I forgot to shift the interrupts that were active as well. So let's take a look at that. When we start, so here we have int flag. When you write to int flag, what you're doing is you're clearing the active interrupt. So that's why it's in the EIC handler. If we didn't do that, if we didn't clear it in the EIC handler, what would happen is we'd immediately call the EIC handler again. We don't want to do that. Um, if we scroll down, we can see here int n set is one, but this is where we actually want it to be two because we switched the pins. So let's make again, and I'm just hitting up to get back to that. And we'll load and we'll reset and we'll continue. And now we hit the breakpoint on the EIC handler. Debugging, it's, it's coding. <laughs> it really is coding. So let's delete two. Let's mon reset again, because we got it working. It didn't look like that I had. Let me check what shows. Let me make sure you can see what I'm doing. OK. Looks like you can. Um, this is what I was worried about. I leave these all over the place when I'm debugging. So uh, for those of you who don't know, that what this is saying is like this thing in the parentheses is assembly. Assembly is the API of the CPU itself. So um, it's a it's a text representation of instructions that are just particular numbers to the CPU itself. And when you compile a program down, it's sequences of those numbers to encode the instructions that sh the CPU should run. And the Cortex M4s, I don't think the M0s have it, but the M4s and the M7s have this uh, breakpoint instruction which if you're connected on a debugger, it will break for you in your debugger, which is great. Um, they tend to, the other way breakpoints work is they tend to, they, you say, hey, when the instruction or when the, the program counter is, which is the like pointer as to what next instruction you're doing, traditional breakpoints are like, if the program counter equals one of these four values or these n values, and that's a fixed resource, um, then break. But if you have these assembly instructions that say breakpoint in your code itself, you can have as many of those as you want. And the other th cool thing is you can actually put it in like an if statement. Say if this thing is is false or true or whatever you want to say, then break. It's really handy for saying like something's messing up this value. If this value is this, which is totally wrong, then break. And then we can try to figure out how we got there. So that's one of my my go-tos in terms of how to debug. So uh, let's delete that, save that, and we'll rebuild and reload um, because we'll just break there. <laughs> it won't be in interesting at all. Uh, continue. Sig trap. See, that feels like it didn't actually reload correctly. So let's just um, make it clean. Oh, did I forget to actually load? Oh, OK, so it sounds like Twitch just blipped. Let me. I am recording this locally as well, so 
any drops and stuff won't be in the recording. Restream.io says Twitch is okay. Oh, <laughs> there is. Oh, nice. I just noticed the Twitch chat. Like, I had the window open, but I hadn't clicked it, so it hadn't refreshed. Um, looks like Pi Piper is there. Mr. Certainly had a link to the Discord. Paul's watching, or at least was, like, an hour and a half ago. So thanks, Paul. Um, Lady Ada is hacking on, or making stuff at the same time. Awesome. All right, we all refreshed. Everybody's streaming because nobody's leaving their house. And I'm going to play video games later. Because, you know. Okay, I think I think we're all set. Um, I think I forgot to load. Cause I, so when I'm doing CircuitPython, I have a thing that will build and load, but I'm not sure that that uh, shortcut works with um, these files. So I did load. Reset and continue. It looks okay. But I also added the extra start that I don't want anymore. So let's delete the start as well. Make again, load again, reset again, continue. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to click USB on and do the Sigrox CLI again. It makes the Sigrox stuff and then runs. But it doesn't look, it still looks like it's mostly just ones. But let's see. Let's see if we can't spot something that's not. Because we still have like a tenth of a second where it's high. Okay, you can see what I'm doing. Maybe, maybe there's a way I can get it without this other output. Charmingly. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Not seeing anything. Well, this is boring. Let's see. How did I do that? You know what we could do? We could just see if it works in Sigrock or in Pulse View. This may crash it, but let's try not restarting it before we try to connect to it. Yeah, I could just do a PWM. That's not a bad idea. Because then, uh, then I know I'm not hitting the high time. Let's let's just try this. Let's hail Mary it, and then if the hail Mary it doesn't work, let's give this a shot. <laughs> Okay, so I have to reset it. So if anybody wants to help with this, that would be awesome. I will push code. So before we before we end up and everything, remind me I'll push it all, so so that we can hack on it. Um, okay, I reset and I connect it again. And I scan, and it works, and I hit OK, and I run, and I can't stop. So I unclick it, 
and it crashes. <laughs> ah, bummer. Okay. All right. Todd's got a good idea. I squared C is complicated. Let's make it simpler. Okay, so we don't need a separate signal generator. We have circuit Python. Uh, okay, so on the overhead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this D12 line and I'm just gonna stick it right on D5. No, no, I shouldn't do that. Let's do, okay, you can see what I'm doing. I'm gonna move this over here because I wanna be able to verify the PWM on the salier. So I'll just, oh, I browned it up. I moved my ground, which I actually do want still. But it's the longest wire, it's so easy to grab. We'll just use that. Oh no, I pulled the plastic off it. I need those, I got those nice silicone ones. I just haven't grabbed them. I haven't used them yet. All right, let's grab the old wires then. That should work. All right, circuit Python time. <laughs> this is why I have a hard time with software sometimes. I do CircuitPython all week, and then I'm like right next to CircuitPython, and then I find a bug, and I'm like, I got to do CircuitPython again. But that's okay. It's easy. Pulse I.O. Oh. Mm, yeah. Do I need to save this? Let me rename. I'm in safe mode, too, because <laughs> I blipped the power. So here's my files. Let's rename this to I2C. And then we can move that off. Save this as code.py. And then we have a new code.py. Since we're iterating, let's do screen to it. And it's telling me that I Split the power, so I'm just going to press reset. Oh, and you can't see my screen either. So, um, if you see, it's ramping. This color is actually yellow. It's kind of hard to see, but that means it's in safe mode. If we click it again, it'll reset, and now it's green. And it's telling me my code's wrong. So back here. We're going to do Todd's good idea of generating just a pulse, a PWM signal out so that we can try to see it on the SIGROC CLI. So we're going to do uh, pulse IO P equals pulse IO dot PWM out board SCL. And do I give it frequency here? I think I do. Try to remember what the defaults are. Something like that. Okay, and let's start this back up since I clicked it extra positional arguments. Pull up the circuit by Fendox. You would think I would know the APIs that I designed. Why, why spend time remembering it when you can just look it up? Oh, it is frequency. T 
to the 14 or 15 is half. So this is a kilohertz. And it's running and we still have logic open. So if we just hit start again, we can see that it's going. Thanks, Dishipu. <laughs> Should have read my chat earlier. Dishipu says it's keyword or keyword only. Generally, if an, if the value of a parameter or a, uh, an argument is a number, I I'd like to have it keyword only because then it's labeled. Okay, so this has a uh, one kilohertz sine wave. Let's just see what happens with that. So since our reset doesn't work. I'm going to reset here and run. And then we're going to skip pulse view and take a look at cigar. Oh, and I got to click my USB on. Oh, I think that looks promising. Does that look promising? Or is it just my imagination? Might be my imagination. I mean, I think the rate that I'm doing it is quite high. But we're looking for one that's just zeros. Ah, there we go. There's one that's just zeros. And this is also interesting if we look um this so okay we're almost two hours in so let's kind of like cover the sigrox side and any questions folks have and then we can wrap up i think i'll do that i gotta commit stuff but i can get a lot done but now you know it all now you can help um what we have here is we received a two byte sample and it actually only occurred for twenty four thousand times 23994. We can run this math actually because um, it's a one kilohertz signal with a 48 kilohertz clock. So I think that's about right because it should be 24,000. Does that sound right? 24,000 per um, half a millisecond clock? Sounds right to me. Let's look at it in pulse view. It might actually work. Okay, click USB off. On reset, continue, click USB on. Pulse view. Like this can be made better. later scan for device that works oh look at that it still doesn't stop <laughs> and the timing is definitely not right but <laughs> click the usb oh and it didn't uh no it didn't crash look at that We've got a signal that goes up and down. Thanks, Todd, for the great idea. That was that was really good. So there is definitely it's it's definitely not right. I don't know. Can we measure? Let's let's see how bad we are. <laughs> how wrong how wrong our measurements are. So we're actually running at one kilohertz. But the way that we're talking to Sigrock, we're telling it it's 4.1 hertz. <laughs> so we're not correctly selling, telling Sigrock what our sample rate is, but that's okay. I know, yay data. 
I'm excited about that. I hope other people are excited about it. We could actually play, we, we could experiment to see how fast of a PWM we can detect too. But I really, I don't, like most protocols, <laughs> most protocols that you debug, they're, they're not like, like a PWM is not spectacular at it because it's always sending data. Whereas like in that I squared C case, it's like, oh, here's a little bit of data and now a second of nothing. Uh, here's a little bit of data, a second of nothing. And that will impact um, like our pipe from pins out USB because there's a buffer within the memory of the tiny logic friend that if you fill it up too fast and the USB can't keep up, like then you're then you're not going to have a good time. Okay, so let's do a brief tour of the SIGROC side of things, uh, just so that we can kind of complete that chain. So uh, I showed the tiny logic friend stuff. That's the firmware that we're compiling and pushing onto the Metro M4. And then what we're running is SIGROC CLI or Pulse View here. And that's not actually, um, we, I haven't changed Pulse View or SIGROC CLI at all. And in fact, I think, I don't even know what I've changed. Oh, I was starting a, a decoder. I was starting another spy decoder for the, the SIGROC decode, but we don't actually need that. The thing that I've been focused on is this lib SIGROC, which is what includes the support for all the hardware devices. Um, and that's where we put the other side of the USB link for a tiny logic friend. So if we look in this directory, there is now a tiny logic friend LA, which I think when I was looking at it, it looks like they have LA as kind of like a logic analyzer suffix. So I added that. And what I actually started with is there's this open bench logic sniffer, and that's the folder I started with. Now there's kind of two standard files here. API, I believe, is the API from SIGROC to the device, and then protocol is kind of like more implement detail, implementation implementation details under that. Um, so if we just go through here, you can see it's got like some other copyright. Let me double check overlapping anything. Let me move it over. There we go. So um, this is some configuration stuff. These are the hard coded. They're currently hard coded names for all the pins on um, within this driver, but my goal longer term would be to load these names off the device itself so that um, this side, the SIG, live SIGROC side, doesn't need to know the individual pin names. And then you can see here, these are the different supported sample rates. Definitely not correct. Um, ways of finding the device. The, so these SR errors, and SR infos are different levels of debugging. And so that's kind of what we were, we were seeing. Um, when I didn't reset it before, we saw this check fail. Basically, like the very first thing you should get is this TLF1, so tiny logic friend one. I just cribbed it straight from the open logic uh, sniffer thing. Da, da, da. And then it actually closes the serial. So it like opens the serial, reads the metadata, and, and does that. Configuration stuff for sample rates and all that, um, whether it's run length encoded, which we actually are always um, not very interesting stuff. I'm just going through here because I haven't actually looked at it that recently. Um, you can turn like different pins on and off, but it's I don't think it's actually worth doing the math on the device side to like shrink pins together. Um, units of like eight are really easy to just copy and move around. So I, I think it's actually better not to, not to do that. Uh, trigger stuff. I think all these changes. So these, these marks here show where I changed. I think they're all just naming changes. I don't think I've basically, I don't think I've really changed any of that. Um, the stuff that I changed more is in this protocol. It's not this stuff. Um, what I had to change was these are the prints for FPGA version and stuff. So potentially adding new commands here and setting sample rate. 
receive data. This is where I've done most of the work because I always wanted to do this RLE process, uh, run length encoded. So, uh, so we say first pair of bytes is the first sample. So we actually get, you have this kind of fence post problem of, um, you get a sample and then how long it lasted and get a sample and then how long it lasted. Um, Mm -mm. So yeah, these SR spew is like the the uh, most verbose option, and then this for loop here is the thing that's copying the last sample into all the individual slots before it then sends it down the pike to um, Sigrock. And I was talking with the Sigrock devs a little bit about how to do this because you saw in those cases where like nothing's happening. I'm getting I'm getting basically 65,000 samples at a time. They suggested that I not just do one giant chunk at a time. So that's why I think I have uh, like this pending samples equals buffer size. So like I'll actually send, call call this session send multiple times so that the like rest of the pipeline doesn't go get overwhelmed with samples. And then that just loops. And this is the code that's probably not correctly stopping. Um, I think that there's uh, like some of these R events FD stuff, I think indicates when you should stop. And I'm trying to do that here, um, trying to clean up nicely. But clearly, as we saw, I'm not, not succeeding at that. Um, OK, so it's just after 3, which means I've been going for just around 2 hours. Um, ask any questions you have. That's been kind of the top to level and the pitch for Tiny Logic Friend. Um, while folks think of things, maybe um, let's just uh, get it all committed and pushed. So if you want to see, if you want, if you want to take a look at what I've been doing um, and have the latest, you can see that. So repos, Tiny Logic Friend. Just commit it. I'm not going to have great commit messages. It's too early for good ones. <laughs> too early in the in the process. Very basic RLE based capture. So we'll push that. And we'll just push it to master because nobody's using it. <laughs> Somebody's thanking me. Mr. Certainly is thanking me for my stream of consciousness and detailed thought process. It's easy. Not sure it's that valuable, but. Uh... Okay, so here's the updated tiny logic friend repo. And then the other thing that we need is we actually need the Sigrock one, which I'm not sure if I've ever pushed sigrock live sigrock let's see our git status i do git status so much that i do it in places that i should not run git status okay uh drew says seeing somebody seeing how someone else thinks about something is very educational so i'm glad you're willing to put in the time because it's definitely not that uh information dense, but okay. And then I'm going to ignore the build directory because that's clearly not, uh, yeah. So Todd bot says, this is great. I learned a lot about SAMD internals. Thank you. Um, I want to point out actually, like we, t we did talk a lot about those internals and that is actually the stuff that we covered about interrupts and peripherals and things like that. It's very generic. It's very like that whole class of Cortex M stuff. Um, let me just show you a not my files. Um, let me just pull up another data sheet for like the NRF. And you'll see that 
da, 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 da. it's actually quite similar. So here's the, the data sheet for the NRF. And if we just uncheck like peripherals here, we get the same sort of like, oh, here's all the peripherals in here. And even like, oh, here's GPIO. And this stuff changes, like w the register summary stuff. Um, and they like to call interrupts events. Uh, but in general, that structure is all of the same because basically ARM has provided all the vendors with all of the glue tools. Um, so if you look in like the CPU itself, for like core components, you'll still be able to find like the NVIC, the interrupt support stuff. Although they try to hide it, but you can, yeah, it's here. Nested vector interrupt controller is 48 vectors. So a lot of the stuff we talked about is actually uh, not that SAMD specific. So actually you learned more than you thought. Um, okay. Git commit first version. Tiny logic friend. And Sigrok. And I don't know if I have my own remote, which I don't. So I will need to make one. Sigrock is uh, different than most of the projects I work on in that they don't actually have, uh, they don't host on GitHub. But that's okay, because I should be able to just do my own live Sigrock. Which is the same name. It might be bad and not put a description. Copy this. And now I can push Tandit Master up to here. Uh, there we go. And now we can look in source and hardware. And tiny logic friend is in there. I'll drop that in the chat. And I'll wrap up. So thank you everybody for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this last two hours of me rambling about all the stuff and seeing how I debug microcontrollers and SVD files and GDB, all of the three letter acronyms. Uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, you can always find me on the Adafruit Discord server, Adafru, A-D-A-F-R-U dot I-T slash Discord. Uh, that will jump into the server. I'm known as Tan Newt on it. You'll see me in the top right as an admin. Uh, <laughs> Lady Ada just, uh, let, me, let me show this off. Uh, don't say anything mean. <laughs> uh, Lady Ada just finished routing a version of the M4 based uh, logic analyzer that if this ever works, we'll be able to sell as hardware. Um, so yeah, ping me on Discord if you want to know more at Tannoot. I showed the links to uh, the repositories. You can find them on my GitHub, uh, github.com slash Tannoot. And uh, if you uh, want to support this effort and see Tiny Logic Friend get uh, more of my time uh buy adafruit hardware and let us know that you uh that you want to see it and you you think it's a great idea uh also contribute we'd love love it if other people helped as well uh i my day job is working on circuit python whose goal is it is to make uh programming microcontrollers much easier than all of the stuff i was doing today i think we succeeded in that and that there's a whole lot more work to do there as well so um Contributors are more than welcome on either of these projects, CircuitPython or Tiny Logic Friend. Uh, that would definitely make us uh, get the furthest. Um, also, Sigrock is awesome if you want to contribute to them and add more protocol decoders. That is something I'd love to do in the future when I actually can get data easily into it. Um, so any help there is really welcome as well. And uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody, again for watching. And I'll see you on Discord.